Well, good morning again, and welcome to North Point Church. My name is Jay Quick, and I am the student ministries director here at the church, and I also work with our young adults. And as you notice from our trailer, we are not in our Gospel of John series today, I Am. We're not in that series. We're gonna study our rhythms of grace and talk about the word today. And I'm excited for a few reasons, because we're gonna talk about a few approaches to encounter the word of God. But in addition to that, we're also gonna talk about why do we believe what this book says? Like, why do we believe that this Bible written centuries ago, why do we still believe in that? And why does it have an impact on our lives here today? And when we think about that question, oftentimes we may be asked that question of like, hey, why do you uh, believe that adultery or murder is wrong? Like, why do you believe those things? And we sometimes have circular reasoning with that. And we point back to the fact we say, well, because uh, the Bible says so. And someone might press a little bit and say, well, why do you believe what the Bible says? Why do you, why do you place your trust in that one? Well, we kind of go, well, because uh, God says so and it's his word, and we kind of have this circular reasoning. And if you know, if you have a toddler at home that doesn't work very well with the circular reasoning because it keeps coming back, why, why, why? And there's deeper answers for that. There's a guy named Vody Bachman. He used to be a pastor in America, and now he runs a seminary in Africa. And he kind of talks about this. And he says, 90% of us Christians don't really have a logical reason for how we explain why we believe what God's word says. 90% of us. And often that response is this, well, why do you believe what the Bible says? And we think this, well, um, you know, I grew up that way. It's something that I just grew up with. It's something that I had in my past. My pastor said that I could believe it. And it's somebody that I could uh, trust. And my family grew up. I went to church when I was younger. And so I've just kind of always grown up and believed this book. And that's, that's great. And for many of us, that maybe works. But sometimes when we go off to college and we encounter another worldview, I may challenge that a little bit. We go, well, this guy grew up uh, another religion. How does that work? And what does that look like? How does he trust that their books are true and mine aren't true? And what does that mean for us? And then we explore the idea of, man, well, how do we know um, the life circumstances that are happening to me right now? How do I align that with scriptures? Because I prayed that this would happen, God, and it didn't happen. How do I know what your Bible says is actually true. And we kind of get in this camp of different camps here. We have this group over here that's maybe a camp of skeptical of the Bible or maybe atheists or agnostics, or they're saying maybe the Bible has no impact on today's age. It's kind of that camp number one. Some of those, maybe, maybe even you're here today as you're a skeptic, you're not sure if this is reliable or accurate. And that, that's an okay place to be. But I encourage you maybe to press in a little bit this morning to say that it's at least possible that God exists, and it's at least possible that this book could be true. And there's kind of this middle camp here where we uh, oftentimes find some Christians, some non-Christians, but say, hey, I believe in God. I believe that God's word is true. I believe that this is the Bible, but it has little to no impact on our lives. It has little to no impact on the things that we do and the things that we say. We may be a big fan of Jesus. We'll say, hey, I'm a fan of Jesus, except for when he plays my favorite sports teams on the weekends, like money, power, sex, fame, some of those things. Like I'll cheer for Jesus all the time, except for when he's facing those teams that I really like. Um, but then I'll go back to him on Sundays and the rest of the week. Some of us are fans of Jesus. And there's this other camp over here uh, that believe that this is the written and inspired word of God, that he wrote it, that he sent his Holy Spirit to inspire authors. And the impact of this man, Jesus, 2000 years ago, still has a profound impact on our lives here and now today. And maybe you find yourself in this camp. Maybe you're thinking, how do I get to that camp? Well, this camp doesn't have it all figured out. Cause I'll tell you that, man, we are still sinners saved by grace and we need his love. But if you're in that camp, I wanna kind of help us answer this question, why do we believe what the Bible says? Because it's an important one because we're gonna be pressed on it throughout our life and the seasons of it. Vody Bachman has this statement that he's crafted and it's a little bit longer and so we'll break it down for us. But Vody Bachman has said this to response of critics and some, uh, some of his teachers from college and things like that. He says, he says this statement, he says, the Bible is a reliable collection of historical documents. It's been written by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses. They report supernatural events that take place in the fulfillment of specific prophecies and they claim to be divine rather than human in origin. So you're kind of like, wait, what did you just say? And I'm like, I remember hearing that the first time and I'm like, I'm gonna break that down for a second. Just this idea that the Bible is a historical document. We can verify that with some things that we're gonna talk about. But in addition to that, there were eyewitnesses that saw Jesus, that saw the names, dates, times, places of these accounts. They've seen some of those things and they can verify those things. And they happen to be during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses as well. Some of them hostile eyewitnesses. This wasn't just an article of a far off distant land where you're like a long, long time ago, you know, or in a far off galaxy like Star Wars. No, this was a real time in a real place with eyewitnesses 
who also had hostile eyewitnesses. So some of these authors of the Bible not only willingly risked their lives, they did risk their life. And they were put to death for their beliefs. They were, they were crucified upside down. They were beheaded. They were burned at the stake. They had their limbs torn off. They were tortured. They're hostile witnesses, yet they still chose to believe this. And in all of our records, none of them said, hey, wait, 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 before you do the head chop thing, like, I, I gotta tell you, this is fake. Like, we made this thing up with the disciples. We got you, we duped you, we duped the rest of the world, it's fake. Like, none of them had said that. Like, we have the authority of the witnesses of scripture against hostile witnesses that they testified to this. In addition to that, this book claims supernatural events that took place in the fulfillment of specific prophecies. There's over 300 prophecies from the Old Testament that we can look to that point to one man named Jesus Christ, the author and the perfecter of our faith. They all point towards Jesus Christ. There's prophecies and Jesus fulfilled all of them while walking here on this earth through his birth, death, burial, and resurrection. And we point to that. And this is, a, this is a book where it's not just a guy got a message in a cave. It's not human in origin. We don't look to this thing like other religions where they say, well, man, I just got this message and I was inspired and I kind of had this vision and this is what we got to do. Because there's other religions that are very prominent in our world today that they got that from a guy in a cave they got some message and the rest of the world is supposed to believe that. So what do we do? I know that's a big statement, but I wanna focus on just the top part of that statement. The Bible is a reliable collection of historical documents. It's supported by 23,000 archeological digs that all say, yep, we dug this up and yes, we can support that. So we're gonna take a look at just a few in the book of John. It's been going through the book of John series as we're saying, hey, there's some names, dates, times, places. We're just gonna verify a couple of those this morning. So the pool of Bethesda is the first one. If you read in John chapter five, you'll read about this pool of Bethesda where Jesus heals a man who wasn't able to walk for 38 years. And I go, man, that's super cool. And I blitz right past some of the meat and bones of this text. In verse two, it says this, that as he, Jesus was healing this guy, he healed him at the pool of Bethesda which had five porticos or five colonnades. Essentially in our language, that means five walls. And so for centuries, all the archeological, all the archeological gurus are saying, man, we can't find this. Therefore, this Bible's fake. There's no such thing as this healing at this pool of Bethesda. We can't verify the pool of Bethesda. Every pool we dig up has four walls. It's a rectangular or a square shape thing. We can't find anything. Until the late 1800s, they dug up the pool of Bethesda. And it was beneath a third and fourth century church that was built on top of the ruins. And as they dug a little bit deeper, they discovered the fact that this is a remake of what it would have looked like in their day. It wasn't just a rectangular shape. It was divided into two basins and had a wall in the middle, a five wall pool, the pool of Bethesda that we can verify historically today in Israel. You can see it with your own eyes. John chapter nine, we also read of this pool of Siloam. It's a pool that was also questioned, man, is this pool somewhere out there? We think it's this one over there. We think that fits the description. We don't really know. Just in 2004, recent history, uh, a sewage pipe exploded. They had to go in the dig out to fix the road. They're going under the road and all of a sudden they start hitting stuff that's a little bit hard. They dig into the steps of the pool of Siloam. As they get there, the archeological people come in, they dig out the rest of it and say, yes, this is actually the historical site of the pool of Siloam. All the critics who said that wasn't it and that wasn't it, they were right because this was actually it. 2004 just uncovered that. In addition to the pool of Siloam, we also have um, another thing that we look to is the Caiaphas ossuary. You maybe are familiar with the name Caiaphas because Caiaphas was the high priest during the time of Jesus. And the high priest was, they brought, they brought Jesus to the high priest and they said, hey man, this guy's speaking blasphemy. Like this guy, Jesus, he's a crazy guy. He said he could tear down the temple and rebuild it in three days. And he also claims to be the son of God. This guy's wacko. What do you think of him, Caiaphas? So we have this encounter in the, in the gospel of John, but I'm gonna read to you from the gospel of Mark, which says this in Mark 16, 61, it says, but Jesus remained silent and gave no answer. Again, the high priest Caiaphas asked him, are you the Messiah, the son of the blessed one? I am, said Jesus. You will see the son of man sitting at the right hand of the mighty one coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the priest tore his clothes. Why do we need any more witnesses? He asked, you have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? And they all condemned him worthy as death to be crucified. So Caiaphas is a role player and Jesus is, he's a central figure in the crucifixion of Jesus. And so some critics have said, we're not so sure about this Caiaphas guy. Like he doesn't have historical backing. We can't really find a whole lot outside of the Bible. Maybe a couple of Jewish scholar supports of him, but we don't really know about this Caiaphas guy. So what happened? 
archeological archeological people went and they dug up this guy's bones. They found the Caiaphas ossuary. An ossuary in that day and age where they would go into a tomb and they would bury someone of high esteem that wrap them up. About a year later, they would go in and they would uncover the body. They would take out the bones and put them in a bone box, which we know was an ossuary. The bone box is inscribed with Caiaphas. It's an indication of Caiaphas's bone box. And to further proof of that, the bones inside of the bone box test to be the same age of when Caiaphas died. So we have bones that are the same age of this guy named Caiaphas. You look at the box, it's inscribed to be Caiaphas. We've got his bones and the critics have been silenced about that. Also in the book of John and the other gospels, we find out about the city of Magdala. Mary Magdalene, which means this, she is from the city of Magdala. There's been critics for a long time of a number of different reasons for that. But they're saying, well, hey, how do we know Mary Magdalene even exists? Like she's from the city of Magdala. Where's the city of Magdala at? Well, in 2009, they were building a guest house near the, near the Sea of Galilee. I've walked around in this area with my wife. I've seen this with my own eyes. As you're looking at this beautiful place, it'd be a great spot for a guest house. They start digging and they dig into a synagogue. And then they keep digging and they build into a port where their fishermen were. And it fit the exact description of the city of Magdala, which we can have uncovered and you can see with your own eyes today. Now, why is the city of Magdala in a, a, a prominent support other than the fact that Mary Magdalene can be verified of her origin? Mary Magdalene was the first to report of Jesus's empty tomb. And why is that significance for us? Because if you go back in history, the Jews couldn't even have a, a woman report in court it wasn't worthy of a testimony. So if this was all a hoax, the disciples did a terrible job picking a woman to say, hey, there's this thing that happened. We can verify Mary Magdalene and her origin here at the city of Magdala that was discovered, you can see with your own eyes in 2009. And if you look close enough, you can see a Bernie Sanders meme um, kind of sitting, okay, never mind. Just making sure you're paying attention to history class. Um, there's no Bernie there just yet. Um, the scroll in John chapter eight, if you go to John chapter eight, you can see at the end of verse or chapter seven, verse 53, you're gonna find something inscribed in your Bibles. You'll see it on your phone. You'll see it in most print. It'll say the earliest manuscripts do not include John seven fifty three through eight, verse 11. They don't include this. And so sometimes we just kind of like zip right over that and then read the, read the story because it's an amazing story of Jesus bending down next to an adulterous woman driving out the guys who are about ready to stone her because they caught her in adultery. And Jesus is like, hey, dude, you without the first sin, go ahead and throw the stone. So that's the story. We all know that quite well. But there's this little text in here that says a truth claim. The earliest manuscripts do not include this. And what they're saying is this, we cannot for sure verify this exact story of Jesus belongs in the Bible. We can't verify that because the earliest manuscripts don't have that. The later ones do. It's been taught in the early churches. This story is there, but we can't verify it in the earliest of documents. So I kind of go, well, man, is it, can we trust the rest of the Bible? How do we know? And this is a profound truth claim for the rest of scripture because it says there's a rigid process of what belongs in the Bible and what doesn't belong in the Bible. Because this story fit the theology of the rest of the Bible, because this fit the nature of Jesus, one who led with grace, yet held on to truth as the Pharisee drove away. He says, hey, go and sin no more. There was grace and truth, truth fully present with this woman. The early people are saying, hey, we, we cannot for sure verify it. We think it's in there, but we're not sure. But the rest of scripture, let me tell you about. The copying of the scriptures and the scrolls was a rigid, rigid process. You go back to about 800, 900 um, AD, around a thousand, somewhere in those years, there was a group of people called the Masoretes. The Masoretes were a group of Jewish scholars and they took the old scroll, scrolls, they took the ancient scrolls and they measured them all up. And what they had going on there is they're saying, hey, does this belong to be preserved in, in the book of the Bible? And so they took the ancient manuscripts from centuries and centuries ago. They said, we wanna prove these things. We're gonna document them here where they can't be touched, where they can't be forged. They can't have, add stories to these. These are gonna be the correct ones. And so they had this rigid process line by line and character by character, they would, they would copy this text to this new text, copy and look back. And they memorized the exact middle part of the Pentateuch, which is the first five books of the Bible, and find the very middle part of it and say, hey, this is the middle of the manuscript. And because we can verify the middle of the manuscript, when we're counting this new one that we're copying, if it doesn't eat, match that letter, we throw it out. Like that copy doesn't exist. It was such a rigid process for the copying of our scriptures.
But what happened after that is they ended up burning the old scriptures. They're saying, hey, we don't, we don't wanna keep these. We don't want anyone to add to them. We don't want people to falsify them. These are the true, true scriptures. So then the critics came along saying, well, how do you have history reporting from BC times and uh, just shortly after the time of Jesus, and then you write this stuff in eight or 900. Well, that doesn't make sense. This surely can't be true. Then fast forward to the early 1900s, we fall in line with a couple Bedouin shepherds who are out hanging out the Dead Sea and they pick up a couple stones and like, hey, who can throw this thing the furthest? And they throw a stone into a cave and all of a sudden crack. They hear a jar break. They explore that and say, that didn't sound like a mountain. So they go up to this thing and they go in there and they find inside this cave, a bunch of scrolls, eight to 900 different scrolls, many of them biblical scripture. They took the scripture from the Dead Sea Scrolls and they sat it next to what they had of the manuscripts from the Masorites and it was 99.5% accuracy. And if you're like me, you're like, darn, couldn't it have been 100? Well, it would have been 100 if languages didn't change over time. Like you look at the British people compared to us, like they spell honor goofy, we're like more efficient. We take out the U, right? We spell it just with, with just an O, we don't use an U. Or a uh, U, an O. <laughs> Third service, man, I'm tired. So... So they, we take out things, but we also add conjunctions for sentences to make sense. We use the word and, or we use the word but to make, to make things make sense in our language because they had so many run on sentences. So the 0.5% difference from the Masorites text to the Dead Sea Scrolls were things such as letter differences, not word differences, just letters and conjunctions. Pretty cool to match that back up as we think about John chapter eight and the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, just for a moment, outside of the, the New Testament, we're gonna go back to the Old Testament. The Tel Dan Steel, this is a cool thing. We'll see the Tel Dan Steel. There are critics of this guy named David, King David. We hear about him all in the Old Testament. King David has said that the, the bloodlines will flow to Jesus Christ, the Messiah. We read that also in the gospel account of Matthew. And so it's very important that David exists because if David doesn't exist, then well, we can't have Jesus because he was from the bloodlines of David. And so the critics said, there are no sources that verify this King, King David dude lived. There's nothing. All we find is in the Bible. King David is just all rubbish. Like we don't believe this. Until 1993, they found a stone in Northern Israel with the inscriptions of the house of David referring to King David. And there were some critics going, well, this is just an insider source. Well, they also found the Moabite stone. And the Moabite stone is also known as the Mesha steel. The Mesha steel is a three foot long stone. You can still see today in the Israel Museum. You can find this and verify it. And what it says is it retells the account of 2 Kings chapter three, where the Moabites revolted against the Israelites and took them over. You can retell the history. You can verify 2 Kings three with this document. It also talks about King David and the God of the, God of the Jews, Yahweh, it references this. We can verify tons of other places we could go to, but this verifies David, it verifies the Old Testament. This stuff is a, a reliable collection of historical documents we can go to. Just for fun, there's a guy named Sir William Mitchell Ramsey. Sir William Mitchell Ramsey was from the early 1900s. He's like, hey, when I read the book of Luke and Acts, something just doesn't really add up. Like I'm looking at that going, the, the dates, the times, the places, I'm not sure if Luke is a very good historian. I don't think I believe him. And so what he decided to do is he took three decades of his life to go discover and learn and process the stuff of the history and the, uh, uh, the book of Acts and Luke's. And he studied these sites in Turkey, he went to Israel. And after 30 years of research and being a critic, he came back and he said, Luke should be known as a historian of the first rank. It's accurate. What he says in those books, I can testify they are real and you can see them with your own eyes. Many even claim that after that, he came to be a follower of Jesus as well. Pretty cool how God works of a critic of his stuff to see history, to prove that this is a real book. There's truth in this book. And if this book is true, how then should we approach this book? And I wanna suggest that we approach this book here as one story. Though it was written over 1500 years, over 40 different authors, it was written on three different continents and it was written in five different languages. All of that together tells one story, one glorious story of our savior, Jesus Christ. The Old Testament points to Jesus, the gospels point directly at Jesus and the rest of the letters in the New Testament point back to the cross and the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. It's telling one glorious story of his character and his goodness and his salvation. But the problem comes when we start to read this book and we think it's about us. We think that this book is about us. I think it's about me. And we approach this thing to say, hey, this is a good roadmap for life. 
This is a good self-help book when I'm feeling down. This is a book that can help me with my addictions or problems or those things, which is certainly true. Like there are wisdom for our relationships. This can be a roadmap for our life and our relationships and our marriage and our parenting and so many things, but it's not the primary purpose. It tells one story of his glory. And when we start to confuse that, we, we misunderstand some of the stories and the characteristics of God that are told to us today. So how do we approach this book? We approach the word of God with a humble heart. And it has to start that way. In Isaiah 55, eight, verse nine, he says this, your ways are not my ways and your thoughts are not my thoughts. So high as the heavens are above the earth, my ways and my thoughts are higher than yours and they're better than yours and they're more accurate than yours. And when I lose sight of this and I begin to read this book without humility in my life, I begin to flip the places like Genesis and I go, God, when, when, you, when you had the Noah and all the people on earth and you just saved a few, but you flooded the whole earth and took them out, why, why, did, you, why did you do that? And I take his actions and I put them into submission of my human finite reasoning and go, God, I wouldn't have done that. Or you fast forward to Exodus 32 after they worship the golden calf. And he says, sons of Levi, go ahead and take a sword on your side and run through the camp and slaughter the people. They end up slaughtering 3000 people that day for the rebellion. And I go, God, I don't think I would have done that. Like, wasn't there another way? Or you fast forward to Job and you go, man, you gave this guy sores. You took away his family. You took away his friends. You took away everything from this guy. Couldn't you have just tested him in one of those categories? I, I don't think I would have done that, God. And when we don't approach this book with humility, we miss the story of his glory and his character revealing to us. And I have to personally remind myself to flip to the New Testament and ask the same question. When I look to the story of the gospels and I see God the Father has one son and only one son. And I have a son, only one son. And he gives them so that his people will have salvation. And as he gives them to his people, Jesus is spit upon, mocked, beaten, bruised, and having nails driven through his hands and feet. And God willingly gives up his only son. And I think of my son and I go, God, I would have never done that. Like, I love you here at North Point, people. Some of you are my friends and family, and I would have never done that. And it is so important that we approach this book with humility and we approach our lives with humility because there's sometimes life circumstances that happen to me where I go, God, I prayed for this and you didn't give it to me. Why did you have this on my plate? I wouldn't have chose it. I, would, I wouldn't have wished it on anybody else. Why would you do this for me? And we have to humble ourselves to a place of trust because we see that God is faithful in this book time and time again. And when we humble ourselves, we can position ourselves like the psalmist in Psalm 119, verse 71, which says this, it was good for me to be afflicted so that I might see your decrees, so that I might see your ways, so that I might know you. It was good for me to be afflicted. And I know some of you may be walking in here today with a deep affliction, a recent affliction, something hard that you're walking through and you're like, there's no way that's good. I wouldn't choose that, I wouldn't believe it. And I humbly ask that you approach your situation and this book with humility because God's ways and his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. He knows and he's faithful in your affliction. And one day maybe we can go back and say, it was good that I was afflicted so that I might learn your decrees and your ways. We also approach this book, not just with a response or not with just a humble heart, but with a responsive heart. James chapter one, verse 22 says this, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves, do what it says. I pray this prayer so often for my children. I think about them and I say, God, I just beg you, please, would they know the gospel? Would they know the, the story that you tell in this book? Would they know the gospel? But it doesn't just stop with knowing the gospel. Would my children someday live the gospel? Would they live your story? God, would they not just know it? Would they live it? Would they not just be hearers of your word, but would they be doers? of your word. And we don't do this to earn God's favor. We don't do this for God to like us more, but it's an expression of our love to apply this book that we have verification to trust and we apply it to our lives. Francis Chan says this, 
about that. He has an analogy where he says, hey, imagine uh, you have a son and you're like, hey, son, go clean your room. And your son's like, okay, sounds good, dad. Like, I gotcha. And you come back an hour later and you're like, dude, did you clean your room? He's like, no, no, dad, check this out. I studied what it meant to clean my room. Like I was thinking about it for the past hour and I studied it and I know how to do it. He's like, well, dude, go, go clean your room. I gotta go pick up groceries. I'll be back in an hour, clean your room. And all of a sudden you come back and your son's sitting in the living room and he's having a Bible study about how, what it means to study how to clean your room. He goes, dad, we're talking about it, different approaches to it. We're thinking about how you clean your room. We're talking about it. And dad, your dad, you're just like, dude, clean your room, man. Like I asked you to do one simple thing. And then your son goes, but dad, I can say how to clean your room in Greek. I studied it. I know what it means. And you're like, dude, no. So this analogy is pretty funny, but sometimes we do that, right? Sometimes we read this book and we read it. God has a heart for the nations and for his glory to extend to all the ends of the earth. And we kind of go, nah, I'm kind of comfortable here doing my own thing. Like that's great for those missionaries, but I'm not gonna pray for them or support them financially because I just kind of like my stuff. Or when God, we read about his heart for the poor and we're like, that's really cool, man. I like the poor too. But then we kind of like to, myself included, just kind of hold on to our possessions and go, ah, somebody else can do it, right? But we read, this, we read this book without a responsive heart sometimes. And I don't mean this to come down of like, go do good works, but by God's grace, may we be motivated to not just be hearers of God's word, but to be doers of it. Going back to the beginning, as we look at this book, it is a reliable collection of historical documents it's been written by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses. They report supernatural events that take place in the fulfillment of specific pinpointed prophecies. The writings claim to be divine rather than human in origin. This book is worth trusting. It's worth saturating your entire life with. It's worth pressing into every single part of your being to know God and to live for God. And I get it. Like, I'm not like, hey, go read your Bibles more. Like, I understand what it means because I wake up some days after my daughter's crying at night. I'm like, I'm just gonna lay in bed and I don't wanna do that thing. I need some more sleep, God. Like, I need sleep. That's spiritual, right? And so I'm not saying that, man, like, beat you over the head with this stuff. But I am saying, can we find ways to saturate our lives with this book? Because it's true. And it cuts deeper than a double-edged sword. It can penetrate every area of our life and transform the way that we live. Can we saturate our lives with this book, North Point Church? so that when we saturate it, it's not just us living for the gospel, but that our friends and our neighbors and those out there that don't know the gospel may see it and experience it firsthand through your life. We have the opportunity to do that. So if this book has many ways and signs that point to it being trustworthy, isn't it best that we live as if it's trustworthy? Let's be a church that knows the gospel and also lives the gospel. Let's pray.